well, good evening all. Um, obviously, if you're based in Greenwich time or nearby. Um, may I start by asking you all to mute and turn off cameras for optimized bandwidth, please? Thanks. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Maria Sanchez this evening. Uh, tonight, ArchiZoom is playing home. Uh, Maria is not only a brilliant academic, she's also a colleague. Um, her talk tonight, titled Dynamic Cartography, Body, Architecture and Performative Space. Um, in her abstract, and I quote, Dynamic Cartographies analyzes the works of Rudolf Laban, uh, Lawrence Halprin, Anne Bogart, Adolfi Apia, Cedric Price, John Littlewood, and Elio Oitixia. Um, they are practitioners who have worked on different areas of inquiry uh, from the existing relations between body and uh, space through movement, events, or actions, but whose work has never been presented from this perspective or in this context. Uh, the work uh, and methodologies set up by these practitioners enable us to develop a practice-based exploration of the space from five scales, having the body as a basic unit, body and surrounding space, body and geometry, body and performative space, body and architecture, and body and landscape. So Maria is a lecturer in interior architecture at the design and design at the Birmingham School of Architecture and Design uh, and researcher at the Center for Interdisciplinary Performing Arts at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire. Um, she's a qualified architect and a professionally trained performance maker. Her professional practice has been developed across several fields related to architecture with a strong interdisciplinary focus. Her PhD thesis entitled uh, Dynamic Cartographies um, that she'll be presenting here tonight, um, Body and Movement in the Architectural Space, is an investigation in how architectural and urban space influence the way we relate to space. Her M MA in Advanced Theatre practice at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama enabled her to specialize in space design within devising theatre processes. In 2012, she was awarded the Injuve Prize for Young Creators in Performance for the piece entitled Basio, uh, which was presented at the Museum of Contemporary Art Reina Sofia in Madrid. Uh, she has uh, facilitated several workshops focused on space and body movement at the School of Architecture of Madrid in Spain, the University of Fortaleza in Brazil, and uh, the University of Winchester in the UK. She has been developing her professional career as a scenographer in London and Madrid, uh, where she has worked as a designer for several companies and festivals. Uh, her work has been presented at the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, Reina Sofia in the Prague Quadrennial Scenography in 2015 and 2019, the Dance Biennale of Venice in 2016, the Arqueria de Nuevos Ministerios in Madrid in 2017, and the Annal of Architecture Venice in 2018. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Maria Sanchez. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, V. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation. And yeah, yesterday when, when I was uh, thinking about how to start this lecture, I was thinking like, okay, this is, this is a journey, this is a big journey, but I need to set up a first point, like when did this journey start? Uh, but really I've been working on this for the last 10 years, so it has evolved in many different ways. But if I had to choose a first point, um, it would be uh, this video that I'm gonna show you. At that point, um, I, was, um, I was a student at the School of Architecture of Madrid, and I was approached by, um, by one of my colleagues at the School of, at the Conservatoire of, of Drama in Madrid. And she said to me, look, I want to do a performance. We don't know how to do it. Why don't you think about a device that, that we actually, we can do something together. And, you know, at that point, um, I wasn't really thinking of uh, theater design performance, but I said, okay, let's do this collaboration together. 
So I'm just gonna show you a short clip of it. It is not. So we managed to see parts of it, but um, yeah. Okay, so let me see if the next slides comes in. Yeah, there we are. So yeah, this journey uh, covers uh, lots of different fields, but my, my main objective was to try to understand different processes that come from different disciplines that actually could be applied to the understanding of architectural space. So in that investigation, I identified few, um, few very significant uh, practitioners. Some of them are landscape artists, uh, choreographers, theater directors, theater designers. There is also Cedric Price who's an architect and, and visual artist. And I just, try to understand what were the different methods that they were applying into their own practices and how I could transfer them um, to apply into my own projects and to apply it just to, to, to understand what are the dynamics of the space, which are much more complex than what uh, we see or what we can actually appreciate. Um, so uh, in I just uh, try to identify different scales of it as well. So everything had to do with the body and the movement of the body, how the body as an individual engaged with the surrounding space, how it's surrounded through geometry, how it's surrounded through the sense space and the ritual spaces, the body and the architecture, like the idea of the spatial dramaturgy that I will introduce later, and the body and the landscape, which is the, the bigger scale. So within that picture, I tried to always uh, understand what was the work of these practitioners and then develop a set of projects of my own in which I could apply the knowledge and the skills and the different techniques and methods that they were, uh, that I was learning from their practice. So the first one, I'm gonna start uh, with Lawrence Halprin and Rudolf Lavan. Lawrence Halprin um, is a, um, is a landscape designer. He is very much in contact with performing arts uh, because his wife, Anna Halprin, she's a dancer and a choreographer, and Rudolf Lavan, he's a choreographer. So at this stage, you know, when thinking about how to understand the movement of the body and the, and the space immediate next to the body, I started looking into ways of uh, transcribing into words of creating cartographies, different ways of just uh, trying to find a system to understand what were the different relationships between the body and the space. So in this search, uh, I found the process that Lawrence Halprin uh, follows, uh, which are the RSVP cycles. I'm not gonna go in depth into this, but uh, I've been using this process um, in projects design. Uh, well, in architectural design, and it's based on a cycle in which you start analyzing the resources that you have, so we can understand it. I mean, this is developed for performance practice, but uh, it can be applied very easily to architecture. So basically, you understand 
uh, what is there in the space, you know, in this case, the site, the different uh, parameters of the place where you're doing your intervention, then you score it, which is finding ways of uh, understanding the reality that is there. So it could be mapping, for example, drawing, etc. Then you do evaluation, which is uh, just getting all the different features uh, that are important. You know, you evaluate what is uh, what needs to remain, what needs to be taken out, or what could be the different uh, approaches to the space. And then you do the performance, which in our case would be the intervention. And again, you know, it's a cycle and go back to that. So I took that from him and also from Rudolf Lavan. Uh, he's a very interesting, uh, very interesting practitioner. He's, uh, he, he's also an architect and he has this understanding of space, but he's mainly known because he develops uh, one choreographic notation, uh, which is uh, the most extended one at, at the moment. Um, there are many different notations, but uh, I went for this one because uh, it is very clear how the different parts of the body are projected in the space. And also in terms of how you represent uh, those movements, those scores, um, it's very systematic. And I found it also uh, very easy to understand graphically. Um, Lawrence Hartbrin also has uh, Rudolf Lavan as a, um, as a resource. So he also tries to, to create, you know, those scores based on those systems of notation. So for example, you know, this is a, uh, this is a score for one of his uh, landscape designs. And this is one of Lawrence Halprin's um, a public space design. Again, you know, it has to do with the movement, it has to do with the different dynamics of the space, and you can see how somehow it's a crystallization, a materialization of those scores that understand the movement in the space. And this is an image from Lavan. Again, you know, it's about how the body moves within the space, how those projection works. You can see on the left uh, the dancer and the structure within she's moving, but on the right you can see how each of the movements and how the, each of the different locations in the space has a different sign. Um, this is also uh, another choreographic notation that I found really interesting in my process. Uh, this is a Sweet by Chance by Merz Cunningham. And what is interesting about this one is that uh, he also uses the choreographic notation as a composition process. So it's not just a way of representing what is already there. It is a way of generating new movements. So what he does is that he just divides the state of the, uh, yeah, the state on different squares and he creates different separate uh, movement uh, scores. And just by throwing a coin into the air, he starts allocating each of the movement scores to each of the to each of the spaces. So actually, you know, it's a way of generating uh, space. So within this context, I I, I started uh, thinking, and this is now part of of my own practice. Uh, how can I start developing uh, a system that gets, you know? all these references, uh, all this way of working, but that is actually uh, efficient for architectural environments because the problem that uh, Lavan system has is that it just represents the movement of one dancer. So how, how do I start representing that complexity? So I went through different iterations using different case studies. This was a very interesting one. This was uh, using Quad by Samuel Beckett. They are just for uh, people on stage and they are moving rhythmically, uh, repeating over and over the same movement score. But here uh, it started changing the trajectory in the space. So that's uh, the first iteration that I did to Lavan system until I just got into the complexity of an urban space. So here there is not only uh, the trajectory, but also there is a representation on of time so the time starts being represented on the on the width uh, and the the space you know it's, it's exactly the same it's it, it can be measured on the trajectory so i got a a, a clip of a street of paris uh, in which there were different people passing by but there were also different shops different things there and i started creating a, a transcription of the movement of each of them so basically uh, the way it works is that on the left you have exactly what's happening there 
but on the right there is a there is like an electrocardiogram like you know an abstraction of that reality uh, so i'm gonna play you the video hopefully you can see this one better yeah let me see <laughs> Uh, a part of it but, but but you know you can see how actually you know it is the same thing well the, on the right side you have a representation of what's going on on the left but you wouldn't realize that those are the things that are happening and actually it was quite interesting when looking at uh, the representation of it uh, compared to the floor plan and to the different images knowing uh, what was there in reality how the the you know how the different things and the different elements in the street were having an impact on the movement of the people so continuing with with this uh, with this investigation uh, i i then started thinking okay well that's that's okay so i know now how to represent through these methods that i'm borrowing from dance and from landscape design um, but now I need to, I really want to understand, you know, what's the, what's the role that geometry plays in the space. So um, I came across, well, I was at that point um, working more on theater more and more because after this first project that I, that I did with the pneumatic structure, I started working into theater design and at some point I jumped as well a little bit into theater directing. So I knew the, the work of Anne Bogart. Uh, for me, she's uh, the most interesting director um, at the moment. I mean, of course, there are lots of very interesting directors, but the system that she develops in which, um, it, you know, it's not about telling actors what to do, but it's about uh, giving them tasks, a set of rules, almost like a game. And that, those sets of rules gets them to um, reveal uh, all the different qualities of the space so her work uh, and her system uh, has its roots on the um, on the performances of the Jetson Church Theatre Group. Sorry, I'm waiting for the slide for you. Yeah. So yeah, this is an image of one of the performances of the Jetson Church Theatre Group, and basically uh, what they were questioning is whether okay. So if I put someone on a stage and that person starts walking, would this be a performance? Would it be a dance or would this not be? So they were always working uh, on the boundaries, uh, questioning what is performance, what is not, what is dance, what is not. So they, they, they start working in this period on the 70s. Also, um, you know, at this point, John Cage is working there. So, you know, it's this moment in which uh, the performance is emerging, performing arts and, and having that as a as a route um there is a choreographer that works with them tina landau and tina landau and and, and bogart come together and create this system which which it's you know it's very simple there are things like okay you have the actors in the space and you ask them to uh, to walk really fast in the space and then to start choosing another person and walk as far as you can from that person or to choose two people in the space and start creating a triangle with them some of the viewpoints because there are seven some of the viewpoints have to do with light other has to do with architecture for me those were the most revealing but it all has to do on how you actually compose movement on space uh, so again taking this as a as a starting point i was like okay so let's uh, try to apply this technique uh, let's focus on one of the viewpoints so i was choosing uh, the architecture one because that was for me the one that obviously had more connection but but also it gave me lots of possibilities in terms of understanding patterns of movement in the space so i started creating uh, these different labs they were i call them movement labs uh, in which I was 
Um, I was having group of actors, performers, sometimes uh, they were dancers, sometimes they were just people that were interested on it, but they weren't professionals in that sense. And I developed three series. So one of them was in Madrid and two of them was in Brazil. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the last one because that was especially interesting. But I was bringing these people into these movement labs and uh, asking them to follow those rules that were taken from the, from the viewpoints. So these are some of the images. Um, and I was recording absolutely everything. And I started uh, transcribing in the very beginning the trajectory of uh, how people were moving in the space. So for example, you know, I have like lots of these, but um, but for example, this would be like a person three or dancer three sequence six between uh, minute 707 into minute 715. Uh, so as you can imagine, there there is uh, quite a lot of material on this. And then there was a superposition on how uh, through the time the space was being used and then, of course, um, uh, understanding that the trajectory wasn't enough uh, because a line just tells you a line, but it doesn't tell you different movements of the body, it doesn't tell you how the head moves, it doesn't tell you how the arms moves, etc. I was uh, transforming uh, those trajectories into the into the lab annotation. So again, creating all these scores that again were giving me much more information about patterns and actually. Um, at some points, there were uh, patterns of movement that emerged just uh, because of the geometry of the space. So there was like a clear correspondence between both. Um, this one was interesting. Uh, I, I had the, the amazing opportunity of uh, being working in Brazil with um, a dance company called Ediska. Ediska, what they do is uh, they they bring people or kids or young people uh, they get them when they are really young like at four years old but mainly they work with young people from uh, two favelas of the of fortaleza and um, they give them a professional uh, education in dance uh, they don't uh, educate them in other areas they just do the basics but um, you need to think that they don't really have any other possibilities so actually you know they give them this professional education in dance and through that they managed to develop their own lives so i was working with them uh, for some time and i also started working on these experiments and they were they were absolutely amazing really uh, on board with all the different projects and um, i started working with them this is one of their spaces so that's why you know uh, it's quite um i mean there are you can see that it's not uh, the it doesn't have the best finishes, but um, this was working on the circle. So I was asking them, okay, so you need now to find another person in the space and just uh, keep yourself as farthest as you can in that circle. So when you were doing that, that specific task within the other geometries, at some point there was a balance and everyone was standing still, but just because of the geometry of the circle, uh, this was ongoing. So you can see a little bit of, um, well, it's just stopping a bit, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame because it's, it's not working well, but anyway, in the, in the, in the original video, you can, you can appreciate that. Um, so, then moving on, uh, I was like, okay, yeah. No. So now I've covered the the body and the space that is there. I've covered the geometry, but what about you know what's happening with atmosphere? What's happening with lighting, which I already started uh, developing before, and and I started working on and studying the work of Adolf Apia, uh, and also trying to understand the the origins of, of the space in a way, you know, because the space have an atmosphere, but but where is that where is that coming from? And also where is the where does the the configuration of the space of the spaces come from? And I started looking into rituals as well. Um, but especially uh, into the work of Apia, which was uh, interesting because uh, it's really atmospheric. Apia was is considered the first lighting designer, if 
the history of uh, performance design. And he, because he really has a control of the light, he creates these atmospheres. And it's interesting, especially interesting this project that, uh, that he did, which is the dance hall of Hellerau in Germany. Uh, because this is the first uh, space, the first, let's say, contemporary theater space um, that exists, where, which means is that uh, there is um, this, the same space for the performance and for the audience. So up to there, there was a separation. So there was a stage and there were the audience, but here he brings everything together. So you can see there the floor plan. And, and also trying to, to understand, I started trying to understand his spaces through, through the work of Peter Sumter, uh, through, the, um, through his lecture atmospheres and how actually, you know, you can look into and start analyzing different features of a space and starting to understand uh, how each of them is configured but by some elements, you know, the, the role that sound plays, the role that lighting plays, etc. cetera. Um, so working on that, thinking of ritual space, thinking of uh, how space is configured, uh, how the different atmospheres are created. Are created. Um, I developed uh, two projects. So one is uh, this sort of, um, these small micro actions in, in Greece in which we were taking groups of students and we were trying to understand the different atmosphere and the, how the different elements had an impact on our behavior and our use of the space. Uh, the same we did in Epidaurus. So, you know, just trying to understand geometrically the space, but also what the space was suggesting to us, again, you know, based on this atmosphere. And it's definitely, uh, Apia's work has had an impact in and, and this understanding of the atmosphere, the lighting and, and the identity of the space on a series of site specific work that I've been developing. Uh, I call this series the interferences with the genius logi. The genius logi in Roman times, uh, it's, uh, it makes reference to the spirits that inhabit a place. So uh, where, it, you know, something that belongs to the place that is already there that uh, you know the, the essence what what a space the feeling that we get when we get into the space so this was the first one uh, the first project we uh, were awarded a residency at the old Vinegal factory in Lima Sol Cyprus and um, we had been developed this piece. It was a theater performance piece, specifically in this project I was directing. Um, so we had uh, some open rehearsals previously, and uh, and we had some performances in other spaces. Especially, I, I remember that we had one in a black box in London, uh, and then we came to this space. So there was a whole. Um, process of understanding of exploring the space exploring what the space in a way wanted us to do there uh, where were the different positions walking around it trying to get absolutely everything that we could perceive from them from it also it was quite interesting because it wasn't uh, well you can see that the materiality of this space is quite characteristic but also as it was an oven factory uh, the smell of it was really strong so everything started being part of the of the dramaturgy of the play. So somehow the um, everything that was there, the space became just an active part of the dramaturgy. Which you know that's something that it's already considered by by Lehmann in post dramatic theater. But here you know it became much more stronger, and I guess that for me it was a realization of that. Uh, and the second, the second uh, project of um, of interferences with the genius Lotzi again, it's a more recent project that I'm actually uh, still working on it, uh, which is Macbeth Proyecto. Uh, so this project, well, it's been um, well, I've been working on it through several years. So it started in 2017. And uh, at the shell, uh, you know that space. But then we moved the project into into 
uh, dig beds, so we used two spaces there. So there it was um, a really, really in-depth exploration on, on how, how space uh, uh, can have you know can have that input in terms of the of the dramaturgy in terms of the script and um, then we we were invited to belgrade we had a, we performed it as part of the iftar which is the the main conference for for theater research and um, then in 2019 uh, it went to well it went to actually it's missing there but uh, we it was part also of the uh, of the Prague Quadrennial of uh, performance design, and then we got an AHRC funding to develop it in in Shanghai. So it's quite it's quite a rich, extensive project in which actually you know this idea of the atmosphere and the and the identity of the space comes into it. And um, so uh, let me just talk through through this image quickly. So the whole idea was uh, to have the text of Macbeth, to have the narrative of Macbeth. And start working on it as a fragmented, um, as a fragmented text. And those different fragments, each of each of them had a, a correspondence with an image. So actually, we got the the space of Centrala and through performance, through sound, uh, through video installation, through objects, we just transformed the space, trying to communicate different parts of the of the play. Uh, after that experience in in Centrala we went to Digbro. Again, this was a very, uh, very interesting one because uh, in the same way as in strings, uh, we had the old vinegar factory here. We were working in a, in a old brew, well, in a brewery, which actually, you know, they are producing beer there all the time. So the smell again became part of the play, but um, the, the characteristic of this space, I don't know if it was, um, well, I, I guess that it's because um, the use of this space is much more designed, whereas Centrala is an arts uh, venue. Um, this place has a really strong character also in terms of the use of it. So um, in the same way that in Centrala, we were a bit in control uh, of the space. Um, here, it just got the play and it re really had a massive impact in the understanding of the play. So I'm just gonna play you if I can, it's a shame, but... Um, a short clip of the performance in Central. Uh, hopefully you will be able to see it. If not, uh, I will just uh, put all the links um, and send them to, to me because everything is online so you can have a look at them later on. Well, you can get some images. You got some images, so anyway. So, and then uh, after after this experience, uh, again, I was like, right. So, so yeah. So I need to I need to now understand or get to an understanding on 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 this idea of of how how actually you know if I can make the space uh, or an installation part of a narrative. How can how can an, a space like an an architectural setting, uh, how can it be designed, or how can I use that as part of, of my design process? Uh, so um, I analyzed the work of uh, John Littlewood and Cedric Price, um, especially the case study of the Fan Palace. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, so the Fan Palace was an unbuilt project in London. Uh, and it was all about trying to to respond to the need of of people uh, having to fill in the hours of their free time and giving them some different possibilities. And um, I guess that my approach to the project is a bit different uh, because obviously, you know, I was um, 
doing research and I was seeing everything that is published. But uh, really my, my approach to it is that it was a truly interdisciplinary project, which it was. Uh, they had a team with lots of people from all, lots of different fields. But what um, I guess that my contribution to, to this is that uh, Joan Littlewood, uh, as a theater director, she actually created a script, uh, an architectural script for the Fan Palace, and that's what uh, underlays behind the, the project of, um, of Cedric Price. Uh, so this idea of the architectural script of, uh, of a space that actually is written through a narrative, and then the space responds to that narrative. For me, it was what it was, the fan palace, and that's what's, uh, you know, the, the knowledge or, or, the, uh, or what I got uh, from this project. Um, so taking this idea of the narrative, again, thinking of how this can be uh, applied uh, or uh, understood as part of a, of a design project, uh, especially, you know, if we go into, into the city, into urban settings, etc. Um, I started working with uh, some colleagues, um, again, from different disciplines. Some of them were designers, but I remember that I was working with a really interesting group of street performers, uh, which I was really surprised by because uh, the knowledge and the understanding that they have of the public spaces, just in terms of knowing where they need to position themselves to be seen and to create an impact on the dynamics of that, that space. You know, I was talking to them and, and, and it was really, uh, really, um, I mean, for me, it was like completely um, understanding it from an architectural point of view, but some people telling, telling you things that actually you, you sort of um, in, had an intuition about, but actually, you know, they say, no, but look, this is a space, we're going through there and that, like in a very architectural way. So anyway, so we started working on the city of Winchester. We were really lucky because the University of Winchester um, allowed us to, to work on their spaces, but also the, the city council allowed us to, did, to develop some performance in the city. So we decided to create, um, again, a fragmented narrative uh, within the city of Winchester. So uh, the project was called Whoosh, but we were using the, the narrative of Hopscotch. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but uh, it's a book uh, written by Julio Cortázar. And uh, it is a book that you can start reading from the beginning to the end, or you can just follow uh, a different order because it works in different ways, like from the beginning till the end, or just going from page 73 to 71. So it, it gives you, I mean, the book itself gives you a map on how to read it. So we use that idea of uh, a space uh, or the way we understand space, because in the end, you know, you are in the city center of Winchester and you can start uh, from, uh, from the gardens and then get into the cathedral, but you can start from the cathedral and then go through the high street and go back to the gardens. And you will still get the same things, but it's fragmenting in a sense that there is not like a timeline or it doesn't start in a, uh, from the beginning and to an end, people get different, you know, uh, different perceptions of it. So we stage different uh, performances in different strategic places of the city. Again, we started walking around. So walking was an essential part of the whole process. And, um, and we brought uh, different parts of the text of the original hope sculpture, but also uh, different readings of the space there, there etc. So it was really interesting the way uh, also people uh, in the city were interacting with us. Uh, also the impact that the different performances were having in the city obviously there was always like a visual element, um, but, but it was all based on like acupuncture interventions on strategic parts of the city. So when people arrived, we were giving them those maps that you have seen before and they would navigate uh, the city center in the order they would like to do. Uh, and depending on the order they wanted, and they also had audio files, et cetera, that they will get a different, um, a different narrative of it. And finally, uh, getting, into the, getting into the space, um, 
I I started especially and also I have to say that uh, the time I spent in Brazil uh, had a big impact on 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 this part of my research um, because I got to know the work of Eliot Isica. Um, Eliot Isica, he's a um, a visual artist that develops his work in the 70s mainly. Uh, but he's really influential uh, in Brazil, not only in visual arts, but in all the different disciplines related to performing arts, uh, in theater, music, etc. Uh, he develops, a, well, he starts a movement called Tropicalia, uh, which is named following this uh, installation. Uh, and it's it's an installation that it is to be explored. Again, it has to do with the senses. He develops the concept of environmental art, which again, you know, it has to do with, with, with how do you perceive space? You know, what are the different materials, the sounds, etc. cetera. But um, what I got from him, um, again, you know, talking about the different tools that these practitioners were offering me and how I could uh, apply them was uh, the, his, his wandering, his walks around the favelas, especially through uh, Moro da Mangueira. So he became a passista who are like the, the dancer, uh, the samba dancers. And he develops this methodology in which he just walks around the favela and through the process of walking, trying to capture or embody all the different features and the things that are happening around him. Uh, he makes a response to that through different pieces of art. So one of them is Tropicalia, which actually it tries to represent his experience of the favela. We can, uh, we can see there the fragmented spaces, the, the different plants, uh, also the different materials of the flooring, etc. Uh, but but also he he created this this other um, I would call this more a performing arts piece because he he that he develops these uh, cloaks these fabrics that people were wearing. So what he does are the fabrics, but he, what he envisions is the whole act of uh, the people who live in the favelas wearing the fabrics and then dancing. And he creates also this duality between the actors who are the people wearing them and the spectators but actually uh, the people who are dancing them were in the beginning the spectators so anyway so you know this idea of 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 trying to understand the city and trying to make a response to it so um thinking of uh, this process of delirium ambulatorium which is the act of walking um i I developed this project some some years ago. I was um, I was commissioned to do um, an exhibition as part of uh, Trellic Taste, which was a, a project uh, developed by a theater company at um, a Trellic Tower. Um, it was funded by different funding bodies, amongst them 20th Century Society, Kensington, um, Kensington and Chelsea Council, the BBC. Um, but I, I guess, you know, the, um, I mean, the project of, of Trellic Tower uh, is part of all these developments that uh, were done in housing developments in the 60s, 70s, especially this one is quite characteristic because, um, you know, it has on the left um, this tower with all the services and on the right all the housing. It's also very interesting when you go there, I mean, I would advise when things um, are a bit uh, more resolved to go and have a look <clears throat> because it's a housing building, but in many ways it brings inside uh, all the urban equipment. So it doesn't feel that you're actually inside a, a housing, uh, a housing building until you get into the, into get into the, into the, um, into the small flats. So anyway, uh, another interesting fact, and this is just out of curiosity, is that um, Ian Fleming, the uh, creator of James Bond, he named uh, he named Goldfinger the villain after Erno Goldfinger, which is the architect because he really hated his architecture. And this is something that actually became uh, quite important in the project. I don't know why, but, but it became part of the narrative uh, and part of the discussions with the residents. So. 
yeah so at this point i was working together with a producer and a soundscape designer so yeah we were given the task okay so you need to you need to create an exhibition in one of the community spaces we already have booked the space and and you know you can visit it we have objects from the residents we have some pictures that they have taken and and I was like, yeah, okay, we can do that. It's fine. So I can do an exhibition. But actually, you know, I, I started saying saying to, to all the team, but let's start walking. Let's start, you know, bringing this idea of the Delirium Ambulatorium that Oitisika has. Let's start walking around. Let's start thinking, you know, what this is suggesting us. Let's see what it emerged from the side. So actually what, what happened was that uh, we ended up not using any community rooms. What we ended up doing was uh, to get all the spectators, all the audience, to walk around the building using it, the building and the walking through it as part of, of the exhibition, trying to get them uh, to perceive and to understand the different spaces um, through their own experience rather than showing them to, to them. And Obviously, you know, we were creating small interventions on each of them. So we needed to, to create some, some bits and some installations or, well, at some points there were installations, other times there were something different, but something to create, you know, to create that, that dynamic, to get them to move to, from one place to another. But again, you know, there is this idea of the, of the map, there is this idea of wandering, of walking around the city, etc. So we created, as I said, you know, small interventions. So one of them was uh, from the outside. We hanged uh, some of the pictures that people uh, were uploading on Instagram from that specific point. Then also there was a lot of work with, um, with the residents. So especially because uh, the Oral History Society was involved in the project. So we managed to, to get lots of, um, lots of archives of their stories and their experiences with the building because some of them they had been there for since the 70s and we got some of the quotes and we printed them out put them in chairs etc that was in the foyer also we were using the the space as a support for projection to play documentaries etc also to put different objects and everything was uh, again followed by you know this this audio file so anyway, so this was a, this was a great experience and, and also a way of, of really understanding space. So I just wanted, I, I just wanted to finish, um, yeah, just with, with, with a reflection um, that uh, in an interview that I had with, um, with Dora, because at some points, you know, it's a 10 years journey. So at some points you, you feel maybe a bit lost or maybe that you know actually what you're doing because there was always this inquiry like yeah but i really need to understand you know the how how the body interacts with the space and what are the different dynamics etc um and and at some point i was talking to her uh, she's the the director of this uh, company in brazil the one i, I mentioned before uh with uh, the young people of the favelas and i said to her look i'm i'm looking into this i i really have a feeling that that actually, you know, the, our body captures the memories of the experiences of space that, uh, that we have had during our life. But, you know, I'm trying to see how to demonstrate that. So I'm applying viewpoints. So I was explaining her all this and she was saying, yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting because uh, when the kids come here the first time, so they arrive from uh, to her studio when they are like three, four years old because they, they do some auditions there. Um, she said to me, yeah, when, when they arrive, um, some of them have a problem. And it's that as they have been raised in the favelas, which is uh, the houses are very small and they always share rooms, but also there is a really fragmented space. When they come here and they see themselves in this big room, it is the first experience, the first time that they actually experience to be in that big space. And also when they see themselves completely in the mirror, they feel really disoriented. So you know, just with that reflection, uh, she made me aware of how actually, uh, you know, the, the influence that a space and that our experience of our space has in our lives. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> we managed to make it work. Thank you, V. Fascinating, um, Maria. 
Thank and you. Get I don't here. know how to do now. <laughs> okay, so can we see you if you if you um yes, yes, okay. So now I can close the yeah. I believe that there will be some questions. So let me yeah. see if I can access um I've got a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to ask, so, so let me just say something. I, I can't really access the, the, the no, message the box. So whoever can access, just uh, <laughs> write it down uh, and read it out loud. So go, go on, Emery. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much Hi. for this presentation. It was very well put together and um, it made something very complex, very clear or at least clear enough uh, for someone who's never heard these uh, terms before, understand it. So thank you for that, first of all. Um, and my question is, um, for someone who wants to maybe further look into cartography and um, the other word, which was um, kinetography, do you mm -hmm. recommend, do you have any recommended books? Like, would you recommend any books? Uh, and what are they? Yeah, I mean, if uh, there are two books actually. Um, one is uh, The Mastery of Movement by Rudolf Lavan, and uh, that's really good because it, it actually it explains his principles and what underlies behind his method. And you know, I didn't have time to go in through that, but uh, it's really good to to see the logic, the logic behind it, and the other one. Uh, it's um, by Lawrence Halprin, and I have forgotten the name, but I can look for it quickly. Ah, yeah, it's Lawrence, Lawrence Halprin, RSVP Cycles. So again, he explains there, you know, all his process, but also uh, all his um, motation. He called, uh, you know, his way of scoring space is called motation. which has to do with movement and notation. So you can see as well there all his references. Lavan is one of them, but you can see all the evolution of his method. And uh, what is interesting is that you can see examples and you know, projects that have been executed and built in which you can see how in the beginning it's a score and how that corresponds with the reality. I think those two are the key ones. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any more questions? Hello, I have a question. Hi, Andy. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much for what was a really, really interesting presentation, especially the diagrams and notation around uh, movement and how they've changed to develop this, this transcript of trajectories. I'm wondering, do you base it solely off of the physical movement of the performers, or is it also to do with the, uh, the emotional experience that you get from observing that a, a performance also. So there are like these two perspectives that you get of the performer themselves creating this trajectory or is it also informed by how you feel watching it? Um, okay, that's a really good question. Um, so I have to admit that um, in the very beginning, yeah, it's a set of rules, just a set of rules. Like I don't look into, I mean, what exact, um, it depends on the project, but uh, in the beginning it's just following a system, like set of rules that get me to understand what's there, like, you know, walking straight, trying to get everyone into the space, do some exercises, warm ups, and, you know, getting the space, uh, communicate you what it wants to be. Uh, but obviously, you know, as a designer, after that, there is uh, some sort of adaptation of the movements. Um, if I was going to go purely through the process, I would just uh, limit to the set of rules and then I would, you know, leave uh, the movement or leave the staging, whatever, emerge from it. But obviously there is, uh, in the end, some aesthetic um, um, decision. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, here it does. Um, the, the focus on the set of rules to determine what that that transcript, that notation would look like is 
seems pretty important to establish that program for yourself. So I can yep. understand that. I guess my second question to that would be, does the, the backdrop behind that also have an effect on how that notation is mapped as a, set, as a parameter itself? I noticed in, um, I think it was uh, m mapping a, a performance on, on like a square stage in relation to Anne Boga, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. Um, is, is that set a, 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 a parameter itself, like a confined um, area that you map in, or is, was that like developed as you were creating the notation for yourself? No, uh, they were, I mean, the whole experiment, because it ended up being some sort of piece, but uh, the origins of the experiments was trying to, to um, replicate how a scientist would work in a lab. So basically, uh, when you're trying to analyze uh, how the different particles um, uh, work, you, what you do is to is, um, isolate them and then expose them to things, but you control the things they are being exposed. So basically, I took out color, I took out light in the beginning. It was just about geometry. And then slowly I started inputting different elements like sound, color, etc. I mean, uh, this, what I showed is just a bit, uh, but there are lots of recordings, lots of things, but that was the whole process. So in that sense, in those specific uh, exercises, they were purely this process of actually trying to do or uh, evoke, um, yeah, trying to replicate the scientific experiments. That's why they are uh, movement labs. Interesting, interesting. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's fascinating. Any more questions? I wonder if I, I might come in with one B. Hi, Peter. Yes, please. Hi, hi. Hi, Maria. Thank you for a, a, a wonderful lecture and really uh, interesting and, and sort of provocative uh, look at how we might begin to think about movement in space. I suppose I, I wondered, um, have you considered experimenting with sort of combinatory drawings as a way of beginning to sort of simultaneously, and I suppose this feeds a little bit from, uh, from Andy's question as a way of beginning to think about breathing a sense of spatial uh, or environmental quality uh, and how that might change or vary within a performance into these drawings sorry mm. uh, sorry and i suppose there's a sort of sub subset of that questioning is is yeah. if you have tried it can we see them please <laughs> So you cannot see it uh, because I don't think I can show anything at the moment, <laughs> but I'm happy to, to yeah, send some images to me. But at some point I developed a project and I don't know if this is what you're thinking of, in which I got the participants, in this case, there were people from different disciplines uh, to uh, start drawing their movements of the space as the first step so basically you know instead of them moving and then me looking at what they were doing and creating a cartography i asked them as a first step to create the cartography so they put paper on the floor a huge paper and they started drawing uh, what was going to be their movement and they did it individually so basically each of them draw their lines you know with the different languages etc and then they had to perform it on the space so it was quite interesting because what they had in their minds, what they had drawn at some point, it became real, but it became real not only for them, but for all of them as a collective. So they had interactions amongst them. At some point, some of them were just getting into the way. So the different, you know, the drawings had to, had to start being changed in that sense. Uh, so I think that's the most, um, yeah, like the most similar experience to something that you may be suggesting. I don't know if that's what you were thinking of. 
Yeah, that, that's wonderful. I mean, I think it, it, it was, you know, for me, interesting that, that, that most of the studies seem to deal with the singular performer rather than the multiple. And so it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear, um, A, the idea of projection, of sort of programmatic projection, um, mm. but, but also um, to, to, to hear that, that that's been, been tried. I mean, it, it would be fascinating to, to know a little bit more about, you know, what the, what the consequences of the kind of scripting versus... Um, so if, 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 in a sense, uh, that there's a, a, a scripting where the, the, the cartography is predetermined rather than uh, sort of post-evaluative, um, mm. it, d d <clears throat> I mean, it, I suppose it must inevitably influence the performance, mm. but, but how, how so and in what way? But, but in that sense, the fan palace is that, you know, the fan palace is oh. a script that it's written and actually... Um, well, I didn't mention this, but I published a book <laughs> this summer. So all this is in the book. But uh, what is interesting about the fan palace is that when you go into the performative aspects of it and how it influences design, um, it's Brecht, you know, so all the principles of Brecht's theater, uh, what he's developing uh, in Germany, they are applied as an architectural script to the, to the dynamics of the spaces of the fan palace as a project. And that's something that I discovered, uh, you know, looking into the principles of epic theater and dramatic theater. And it's quite clear how you can actually, you know, start looking at, okay, so this is what epic theater is. Uh, this is what dramatic theater is and how you can map the traditional or traditional way, let's say, of understanding architecture uh, to, to one of them and how the other one that comes from Brecht you can start seeing all the different features of the fan palace and the design of price on it. So in that way, I think that is uh, one example, just that it wasn't built. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Peter. Okay, um, I'm gonna, my turn now. Um, is there any other question? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Okay, Cameron. Uh, hi, hi, thank you for that, Maria. That was really interesting. And I absolutely love the sort of work. Um, I just wanted to know, sort of, I guess, sort of a double prong question. Have you sort of ever incorporated or looked at the work of, say, Bernard Chumi, who we kind of looked at in our sort of our third year and, and how his sort of notations and transcriptions were applied to architectural space? And then to sort of the second part, so what insights could, could you kind of as your work offer about how, um, say, the difference between, part, uh, you know, cartography and how, and, and often in sort of Shumi's work, he talks about uh, the architect, the inherent violence in architecture and the violence of bodies which sort of enter into like a perfect architectural space and, you know, change things and manipulate things and, and, and also then work to, to sort of you know build that idea of space yeah so i didn't hear very well that question because you have quite a lot of echo uh i heard about bernard Chumi, uh how i incorporate that so um i didn't work that much into its his graphics uh although i'm i'm familiar with the manhattan transcripts but I worked quite a lot with uh, his uh, definition of events and situation and how events are defined. You know, it's something that is happening. You know, it's something that is completely uh, there. Um, now this is happening here, then it's happening that. And, and how situation is something that is open-ended in a way. So uh, especially when I was uh, working on, on, on the project of the fan palace, and you know this idea of the special dramaturgies and all that, I and that's something as well that I have incorporated into into my work in in design, especially in performance design, is the creation of different situations, which is like contexts where bodies can perform and bodies can can develop things. So it's about giving possibilities, but not defining exactly what's going to happen. So I need to ask you now to, to repeat the second question because I couldn't hear it. Hi, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, let me know if it's too echoey, but I was just wondering if the, it's sort of giving you any insight on the sort of difference between, you know, the, the sort of um, cartography and dance and how architects may program movement into space. Because I know Tumi quite often references that, you know, architecture isn't like a sort of, it isn't like an autocratic ballet and it has very uncertain elements. And I think, you know, what is your work, do you think, has it given you anything on that sort of line or? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I would say that cartography is a representation, uh, just, um, just a representation at the moment. But what I would like to think, and if you think of that uh, drawing that I showed uh, of Merce Cunningham, that sweet by chance, that uh, score, um, I would like to think, and that's what I've tried or I'm trying to apply in my, in my work, that actually a cartography, instead of being a representation of something after it happens and based on the observation, how it can be um, a, a um, a tool, a tool or a process of, or part of the methodology. What happens if we create the cartography? What happens if we create all these open endings? Uh, if we create uh, all these drawings that gives us all different possibilities and then those cartographies trigger the space and they generate them. So, so I guess, you know, it's about challenging the, the idea and the concept of cartography from something that it's a map, that it's a representation tool into something that is a design methodology. Oh, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions on the chat? I can't access the chat. Uh, um, I don't wanna disturb <laughs> the sharing screen at the moment. You can, but well, I don't know if you have to share the screen. You you don't have to share the screen. I'm I, no, I don't want to share the screen. It's not about that. It's accessing. It's it's behind. I can't. Um, sorry. <laughs> Anyone? So, so Maria, um, I mean, I, I, I find it fascinating, uh, uh, your processes, uh, um, uh, and the methodology that, that you've, you've put into, to your, your work. Um, and I, I want to draw a little bit of a bridge into my year three, which the students will be starting, uh, uh, their mapping exercises, uh, from tomorrow. So I, I'm wondering if you could, uh, um, you know, address, and I do apologize for being specific into a handful of students that are, um, but also to year three, where, where they move from, from this sort of kind of a stating the obvious site analysis that they've been, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with into, uh, let's say, the, the art and science of, of mapping, uh, be that an event, uh, uh, um, or a moment. So, so could you talk a little bit more about the processes, you know, the, the design process that goes into uh, uh, mapping uh, an element or, 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 or an event and how would you advise students into sort of kind of a deconstructing and reconstructing uh, um, something that becomes more conceptual the moment you... you... Mm. So, um... I mean, I, I really find fascinating working with the parameter of the everyday life, especially when you have to do a mapping of a space, you know, looking into patterns, into repetitions, things that happen all the time, because also you need to think that, you know, mapping uh, needs to have, or, or I like, uh, I mean, I know that there are different ways of doing this, but uh, I like to create a mapping drawings that communicate things that are measurable, where you can actually communicate uh, measures, time, etc. So I find that the moment in which you start bringing all these parameters into the drawings, like how do you represent time? 
how do you represent space how do you represent levels of noise things that are measurable um, and you actually bring scales to it uh, you know you start defining uh, as much as for information as you can but in a way you know being like a scientist like saying okay i'm gonna be very rigorous okay this is not a wave sound you know i just go and i start measuring the sound at mm -hmm. each point you know it's about being very systematic and repetitive um, and i think you know it's looking about it's looking on the repetitions but also the iterations within the repetitions so um, i I guess for me in my process, it's what it works like, you know, creating a uh, mapping drawings that I can actually interpret afterwards that yeah, can be expressive, but that expressiveness needs to be contained within the system. So that's why, for example, with Lavan, uh, the system on itself is attractive, you know, because it just uses these blocks and, you know, you can start working with them. But once you get into the system, you don't think actually it could be done by a computer so that actually identifies the different movements and just makes those signs correspond to that. So I would say that uh, it is the method what needs to be expressive. And then the rest, it's about representing things. Do, do you mean the rules? You know, setting yeah. up rules? Yeah, exactly. It's about setting up rules mm -hmm. uh, in all possible ways. So, so you know, if this is happening, you know, let's say, for example, with Lavan, if there is a hand, that hand has a correspondence and it's, uh, that correspondence is a sign. And, you know, it's, uh, it's about having the set of rules really clear. In this case, they're going to be classic, uh, graphic rules and then uh, just applying them. But that set of rules needs to be thoroughly thought before starting with the mapping process. Absolutely. It's fascinating. Um, um, did you at any point um, introduce any sort of kind of uh, uh, text from Deleuze, you know, for measuring time and... and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've gone through. Yeah, I have worked with the list, but I have worked with the list in cinema uh, because I was obsessed, we're well, not obsessed, okay, that's not the word, but I was really interested in the beginning of uh, how cinema captures movement and time and how uh, the figures and the bodies get deformed through movement and time. So that's what I, you know, this text on cinema that he has. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, I have one more question. Go on. Yeah. Um, uh, Maria, you said, uh, you know, obviously there, there has to be, it, the expression should be contained within the system. And you said that time, space, and level, things like levels of noise should be, you know, be, we should be able to measure them and uh, have them like contained within the system anyway. Um, so could you in any way relate um, the studies of movement and all of those things that you just talked about to levels of noise and how they relate, how they may relate to sound. And if so, again, I will ask this, are there any books you'd recommend on something like that? Because I am curious why you gave that as an example in between both space and time measures. Well, um... I mean, I I developed that, you know, that was my, I mean, when I was working on this, uh, I was doing my research on dance and I was obsessed with those two measures because um, in the end is what architects we work with. We work with measurements like meters, but what we don't uh, realize is that we actually work with time because, you know, if we create a room, this, this room it takes for a person x time to go from one place to another also the spaces that we create they are faster spaces or yeah faster that more dynamic spaces are more static spaces so you know when you go into a museum that space somehow makes people walk slower and that has to do with the atmosphere etc so that's why i was so obsessed with space and time so 
that's why uh, when I started looking into, because I started looking into movement. So if you think of movement, you go into dance. So I started working with, um, with dance notations, with Laban. Um, but the problem that Laban had is that it shows time, but it doesn't show space and you cannot measure it on space. So I developed an iteration of his notation so I could actually represent those both parameters and create a system that, uh, that you can apply to architecture because that system doesn't exist. Um, so the only reference uh, that I have um, of um, this sort of work is a space syntax, but still, you know, it's still very far away. Like you don't really know exactly what's happening with that specific space. So I cannot recommend any books. I can just recommend you my book where I tell uh, how, to, how I developed that system because I couldn't find any. So that's why I had to do it myself. That's a great recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not that I want to recommend it, but you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> so we all there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? I guess we should wrap it up, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, such a provocative uh, uh, um, Absolutely wonderful lecture. Um, thanks for, for, for taking time to, to, to join us uh, uh, and show us your work. Um, I'll be posting your book shortly. <laughs> I think she, everyone should have a look and, and, and get it. Um, well, thank you everyone. Uh, um, and, and thank you again, Maria. Fantastic. Uh, um, thank you all for zooming in. Um, keep safe, everyone. See you next thank week. Thank you. <laughs>